Okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to Dow 2002 CPD webinar series organized by Dow 2002 alumni. Uh, today we have with us uh, Dr. Vakas Shafiq, who is a consultant endocrinologist and diabetologist at Shokat Khanam Memorial Hospital in Pakistan. And he's going to give us a talk on incidentalomas, adrenal incidentalomas. And the second talk will be from uh, from myself on acute stroke. So uh, over to you, Vakas. Thank you very much. Thanks, Naseem. So my talk today is on adrenal incidentaloma. So I'm just going to uh, ask two questions here so, so we can start working on it. And then later on, we can uh, discuss these questions. So our 23 year 23 millimeter adrenal mass is discovered in a 53 year old lady while investigating for cholelithiasis. The mass is oval in shape, hypodense, density is five pons field and homogeneous. The patient is normotensive, BMI of 24, fasting glucose of 80 milligram per deciliter or for, for UK colleagues, 4.4 millimole per liter. A, urea, uh, electrolytes, and creatinine normal. So I just want to ask from the audience, do you think that, that this lesion need further investigations? If anyone want to comment on it? Yes, it should be. It could be an adenocarcinoma of the adrenal gland, could, could be a normal cyst, could be uh, a complex cyst, but we need to find out with further investigation as to what it is. And, and what do you think investigation could be? I'll go for a, a she's a 53 year old lady. I'll go for a CT after pelvis with contrast. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's good. So let me ask this second question. So it's slightly different, and then we will discuss these questions. So, case two a 28 millimeter adrenal mass is discovered in a 40 year old gentleman while investigating for renal colic. The mass is round. Density is 35 Hansfield and heterogeneous. The patient is normotensive, BMI of 32, fasting glucose of 90 milligram per deciliter or five millimole per liter. What is the most appropriate step? So there is a slight difference earlier. The density was uh, less than 10 and now it's 35. Do you think, anybody think that any, is this lesion anything different from the earlier one? It could be a complex cyst. Okay. So let's start. So we'll answer uh, this question. Sorry, Vakas, uh, you said that she, the patient is normal tensive and the electrolytes are normal. So the potassium, sodium are normal. Is that yes. right? Yes. Okay, so that's important to bear in mind. Yes, I agree that it could be a complex test and probably would need to investigate this, characterize this further. Okay, yeah, absolutely. So we are going to, to come to these two questions at the end of the, the talk. So we will try to cover these two cases in the talk. <clears throat> so adrenal incidentaloma is an asymptomatic adrenal mass detected on image not performed for suspected adrenal disease. So you might have a patient who you have investigated, for example, for uh, a renal colic, you might have investigated for polylithesis, or you might have investigated for, uh, for um, pain, uh, abdominal pain, loin pain, but these are those where you are not suspecting that this patient got a Cushing disease, um, either that patient have a full-blown cushionoid features like purple stria, thin skin, or you don't, you are not expecting in uh, a case, for example, someone who got a uh, hypertension, who got hypokalemia, or hypertent, or the patient is hypertensive, needing two or three agents. So these are not that patient. These are those ones, uh, or this talk is based for those ones where you are not suspecting an adrenal lesion, when you have done the CT scan, you have found that they got a lesion. In most cases, 
adrenal incidentinoma are non-functional adrenocortical adenomas, but may also represent conditions which require therapeutic intervention, like adrenocortical carcinoma, pheochromocytoma, uh, or hormone-producing adenoma or metastasis. So discovery of adrenal mass raised two questions that, did, that determine the degree of evaluation and need for therapy. First is, is it malignant? Is it functional? So for every adrenal incident diploma, that's what the two questions you want to answer. So the first question, is it malignant? So if you look at the European Society of Endocrine, Endocrinology guidelines on adrenal incident diploma, so they suggest all adrenal incident diploma should undergo an imaging procedure to determine if the mass is homogeneous and lipid rich and therefore benign. For this purpose, we primarily recommend the use of non-contrast CT. So as a physician, you might have received a non-contrast CT report, or you might have received a contrast CT scan report. And in that case, it's important to speak to your radiologist. If it's a non-contrast CT scan, then the things are much easier. But sometimes the radiologist might not have done the reporting as ideally it should be. So if any doubt, you always need to speak to your radiologist. So if we are, talk, if we are looking at the non-contrast CT, then we looked at the Hans field, which is actually the density. So uh, someone who got a Hans field, adrenal lesion, which uh, the, the density is less than 10 Hans field, if it's homogeneous and is smaller than four centimeter, then you need no further imaging. So that these three criteria, that is, that if they got a Hans field of less than 10, if it's homogeneous and smaller than four centimeter, then you need no further investigation for malignancy risk. You still need to assess for hormonal function, which will come uh, later in this presentation. But your first question, either there is a risk of malignancy then on, on non-contrast CT, Hans field less than 10, homogeneous, smaller than four centimeter, no further imaging and life is easy. Now, I will explain a bit about it. So non-contrast CT scan, if a adrenal mass measure less than 10 on unenhanced CT, that is, that has the density of the fat, the likelihood that it is a benign adenoma is nearly 100%. However, 30% of adenomas, which means that they are benign, do not contain a large amount of lipid and may be indistinguishable from non-adenomas on non-enhanced CT scans. So if the mass is heterogeneous or show a density of more than 10 or is the size is more than 4 cm, it is indeterminate and further imaging is required. At this stage, I will say, if you got an indeterminate nodule, then you definitely need to involve the specialist. Uh, as a generalist, uh, it's, it would be a bit uh, difficult to deal with this group. So as a generalist, the main is that if the Hans field is less than 10, if the size is less than four and the mass is homogeneous, then it is safe. If, if those criteria, these three criteria are not fulfilled, then that patient need to refer to uh, the endocrinologist or, or refer to the specialized as per your hospital policy. Till now, if there is anybody want to ask anything. Hello. Yeah. Why, why, why do you not do a CT with contrast? Sorry, say again. I was asking, uh, okay, why can't we go for a CT with contrast? Well, I will come to it because uh, there are specialized uh, criteria. So uh, the, this criteria is mainly for non-contrast CT. When we are going to talk about the contrast CT, mm. then we are going to, so in inde indeterminate nodules, we actually look at the contrast CT, but then we look at a different angle, which, which is a later part of this presentation. So that, okay. that's the next slide, I will explain you. Okay. But uh, for non-contrast CT, the initial part actually uh, 
if if the initial criteria are fulfilled then then it's all fine if there is any doubt you can always discuss with your radiologist and that radiologist can guide you that either um, that's fulfilling the criteria for benign or not right the reason i asked this question is because we are talking about uh, incidental uh, uh, incidental omas right so we naturally i am assuming that this guy already has had imaging and that's why we found that uh, nodule or mass or whatever we're discussing and this is why i'm asking that why now we are not doing a ct and why should we then proceed to do another ct radiate the patient and then follow it up with another ct with contrast so i hope you understand that, where i'm coming from yeah no i can really agree with your point now that like the later on for indeterminate nodules they actually look at the specific stuff so that's actually a washout we looked at and there mm. is a separate protocol for it mm. uh, not on a routine contrast ct you can comment that either that mass is benign or not there are specific criteria uh, which are coming in the next part so i mean that will answer your question okay so that's next so if the nodule is indeterminate so ct scan with delayed contrast media washout we normally do and we actually look at absolute washout or relative washout i will explain this in the next slide so if there is a nodule which is indeterminate we have to do one of the three either we do ct scan with delayed contrast media washout either we do mri chemical shift analysis or either we do fdg pet and that's why i say these are the three things these these are the point where actually your specialist uh, who is dealing it who is who is discussing this case in the mdt have to deal with it so coming to the ct scan with delayed contrast media washout so adenoma typically exhibit rap rapid contrast medium washout whereas non adenoma have delayed contrast washout so 10 minute after administration of contrast an absolute contrast medium washout of more than 50% is reported to be 100% sensitive and specific for a adenoma when adenoma was when adenoma is compared with carcinoma pheochromocytoma and metastasis so it is actually a special protocol where they give a contrast and then take the images uh, initially and then at 10 minutes and if the washout is more than 50% then it is benign if the washout is not more than 50% then that is not benign and need uh, further investigation either you get this tumor out or um, you do the hormone hormone test and all the rest but if it's if the washout is more than 50% then you are safe it's benign but still th these are the specialized tests and that need to be done by the specialist if for example you talked about the patient had ct earlier and you don't want to give the radi uh, the radiation again then the other option is you might consider mi mri chemical shift analysis that is also on a specific protocol that's not a routine mri so in mri chemical shifting analysis so whenever you want to make a request to the radiologist you have to write in the notes that this is the adrenal incident loma so you have to do the mri adrenal protocol and that's they understand what you are talking about so mri uh, adrenal protocol what they do is they do they look at the chemical shift imaging it is a form of lipid lipid sensitive imaging based upon the principle that hydrogen proton in water and lipid molecule resonate at different frequencies referred to as chemical shift benign adrenal at uh, adenomas lose signals on out of phase image but appear relatively bright on in phase image so your radiologist will be able to tell either the feature are suggestive of adenoma or not if it's suggestive of adenoma that means it's benign if it's if uh, if it's not losing the signal then that means that it is not benign it could be adrenal carcinoma it could be pheochromocytoma and most of these tumor then need to come out after discussion in the mdt 
And the third test, as I just say, was the PET scan, where, as I say in the earlier, where if the uptake is less than liver, it is indicative of benign lesion. So I just repeat what I talked about. So those ones which are indeterminate, you either do a CT scan with delayed contrast media, you might do MRI chemical shift analysis, or you do the PET scan. You can choose any of the three, all three give you uh, the similar sort of results. If those criteria which are, which are written here are fulfilled, then it is benign. If they are not fulfilled, then it could be malignant, which is adenocortical cancer, or it could be pheochromocytoma. Any question in that? Till, till, till this uh, presentation? We'll take it in the end, Bokas. Okay. Yeah. So, so the next point is actually, is it functioning? So first part was, is it malignant? Now the second part is, is it functioning? So all, all adrenal incident loma should undergo careful clinical examination where you looked at either they, uh, they, you looked at their symptoms. For example, if it's a Cushing, you would be looking for rapid weight gain. Um, the patient will have diabetes, hypertension. Uh, on examination, they have purple striars. They will have uh, thinning of skin. But these are for full-blown Cushing. But here we are talking about those one, which might have subclinical Cushing, which means that they may have subtle signs of Cushing. So mostly they might have, they might be obese, they might be hypertensive, they might be you might be seeing a patient who is diabetic, and it become very difficult to be judge to be judging either they got Cushing or not. You might be seeing patients who uh, are hypertensive, who uh, might have hypokalemia. You might be seeing patient, for example, in adrenocortical cancer. You might see the women who uh, got hirsutism, um, period disturbance. You might uh, see men with gynecomatia because adenocortical carcinoma can secrete cortisol. It can secrete testosterone uh, or DHEA in women. So you have to do the clinical examination. You have to look for uh, if there is any signs of hormone, adrenal hormone access. If we talked about the blood test for all adrenal incident lomas, if unless if it's clearly uh, myolipoma, which is one of the category which your radiologist will talk to you that they are those which are actually the fat uh, and normally they don't need hormonal assessment. Other than myolipomas, you all these patients need to have overnight dexamethasone suppression test. For this, you give one milligram of dexamethasone. Uh, to the patient at 12 o'clock midnight and check their cortisol at 9 a.m. In some places, either they give at 11 o'clock uh, at night and check their cortisol at 8 o'clock. The other important test is uh, that you rule out the pheochromocytoma. For this, you either send plasma-free metanephrine or metanephrine, which um, we are doing in Chokathanam and few American centers are doing, a lot of the UK centers are doing urinary fractionated metanephrine. Uh, you're doing either test, that is fine. The both tests can exclude the pheochromocytoma. If you've got a patient who's got a hypertension or hypokalemia, you want to do aldosterone renin ratio as well. You don't need to do aldosterone renin ratio if the patient do not have hypertension or hypokalemia. Whereas the above two tests you have to do in all patients with adrenal incidentaloma. I've just put a slide here for dexamethasone suppression test. Um, so if your test is less than 1.8 microgram per deciliter, which means that uh, cortisol in the morning, or less than 50 nanomole uh, per liter for, for uh, UK colleagues, then, then subclinical Cushing is excluded. The full-blown Cushing, you would see uh, the clinical examination. And for that, you do a dexamethasone suppression test and you can also do urinary free cortisol. 
But for those where they don't have any gross sighing and symptoms, uh, overnight dexamethasone suppression test of less than 1.8 or 50 uh, nanomole excludes subclinical pushing. For so those two more minutes. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, sorry. Um, so, um, if you've got a more than 50 or 138 nanomole per liter, then that means uh, it is subclinical pushing. If it's between 1.8 to 5, then it is uh, borderline, and then you have to assess their other comorbidities. So, the next slide is on adrenal biopsy. Adrenal biopsy is not recommended in the diagnostic workup of patients with adrenal mass unless there is a history of extra adrenal malignancy. And for these patients, you must exclude the pheochromocytoma by doing their blood test. So coming back to the first case, uh, because of the time limitation, I will just uh, answer this question myself. So this patient, you see the mass is oval in shape, hypodense. The density is five Hounsfield and hem homogeneous. So that actually fulfill all the criteria for benign. So you would not need uh, the test for malignancy. However, you would need the test for the functional assessment, which is um, if we have these options. So the, the option will be option four, which means that you check plasma metanephrine, non-metanephrine, overnight dexamethasone suppression test. And if it's normal, you, you reassure and discharge the patient. Coming to the sec, second one, the second one, had the only difference from the first one was that the, the density was 35 pounds feet. So this patient, you want, this nodule is indeterminate and you want to do interval CT scan or MRI or PET scan along with the functional assessment. I just put this last slide. Um, that's actually, uh, this is actually, a flowchart which I took from uh, Endocrine Society, European Endocrine Society, which is saying the same stuff that you got adrenal incidentaloma, you assess in parallel, either it's potentially malignant or it's functionally active. For potentially malignant, you do the non-contrast CT. If uncertain, you do the other test. If it's, you do the functional assessment. Now, with all that, you come to the point that you come either it's a non-functioning benign lesion, which you don't need to do anything. If it's adrenal adenoma with autonomous cortical, cortisol secretions, you then discuss with the patient, the patient comorbidities, discussion with the patient, either that patient should undergo surgery or not. Uh, and that's your specialist will do that. The third part is where you got a person who either got a malignant tumor like adrenocortical cancer or functionally active like pheochromocytoma or pushing, that patient needs a surgery uh, and pheochromocytoma, they need preparation like alpha and beta blockage before the surgery. If it's indeterminate, still if it's indeterminate nodule, you might consider surgery, you might consider a bait and watch, uh, or you uh, might actually, uh, so that's actually a discussion with the patient regarding either to monitor it or either to remove it. With this, I end uh, my talk. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Akas. Um, so if you stop sharing your, uh, your presentation. Uh, yeah. Can you all see my screen? Yes, Nassim, we can. Yeah. Can you hear me as well? Okay, very yes. good. Thank you. Now, just please um, all uh, mute yourself so that I don't hear the, the background noise. Now, my presentation, first of all, uh, somebody pulled out at the last minute, so I had to uh, step in. Uh, uh, what I thought I would do is just go through really very practical steps in the management and assessment of acute stroke that come through the door and what are the what are the really the, the key steps in the management of acute strokes so just one slide to show you how significant a stroke is and the disease burden uh, every four seconds someone somewhere in the world suffers a stroke
and every six seconds, someone dies from stroke. And 50% of patients who have suffered a stroke never fully recover. One in five need help with the care, and it's a number one cause of disability, preventable disability worldwide. Um, really simple, straightforward, 80% are infarcts, which are caused by the blockage of the artery, and 20% are bleeds caused by the rupture of the artery. This is just a scan. Now, those of you who are not radiologists or stroke physicians or neurologists, even, even a non-radiologist non, uh, can uh, uh, spot uh, where the problem is. So this is a slice of a, of a CT scan, non-contrast. And you can see that uh, the right-hand side of your screen, which is the left-hand side of the patient, it looks quite black, uh, quite a large area. So this is bad. Okay, this is what we call hypodensity okay so if the brain substance is is has a density so it's isodense so anything which is less dense will look black and anything which is which is more dense than the brain substance will look white and that's called hyperdense uh, for mri scans you use the word intense hypo intense hyper intense so please don't use hyper intensity on a ct scan Okay, that's, that's incorrect. CT scan is dense. So hypodensity, you see this black area, so that's bad. So that's a, a large area of your brain is infarcted and your, when your brain infarcts, uh, after a few hours, it looks black. This is another uh, slide. You can see the, the, the posterior part of the brain. It, it's looking hypodense. There is an area there and it is, um, uh, again, a bad sign. It's established stroke. Now, the structures you see in the middle, you might ask, well, are those bleeds, those tiny two things? No, they are not. So there are some things that are bright on, on CT scan, and they are normal. So the structure you see right in the middle is, is called pineal gland. It gets calcified as we grow old. It's not calcified when we are born, but as we grow old, it gets calcified. And the two tiny structures you see just lateral to the, to the midline are basically arachnoid granulations that are calcified. The, the CSF producing areas. So apart from these, these uh, 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 densities, anything else that you see dense or white is usually a bad sign. So, so the skull looks white, uh, pineal gland looks white, arachnoid granulations look white, and also sometimes you see calcifications in the basal ganglia that look white. Anything else that's white is usually bad, it's blood. So there it is, that's blood. Okay, so this is hemorrhagic stroke, large area, and it's hyper density, okay? Um, the strokes that we see in the very hyper acute stages are usually, well, if you are seeing a hyper density, it means that the stroke is already quite established and it's a bad sign, which means that you should be very cautious, you know, really, I mean, thrombolizing that patient. So either it's an old stroke or the stroke is, you know, really very established, a few, few, at least good few hours old. Now here, what you see on your screen is a very, very subtle sign of, of, of acute, very hyper acute stroke. If you see this loss of gray white differentiation, can you appreciate it? If you look very closely, I mean, on the, on the left hand side of your screen, you see sulci and gyri, very nice, yeah? And on the right hand side, you see this sylvian fissure, it starts to get a bit blurred. And the, the, the whole brain substance like looks like one. I mean, there's like, like paucity of sulci and gyri. So that's swelling, that's, that's edema, that's bad. And after a few hours, it will, this, this whole area would, look, would, would turn black. Um, this is another one, uh, easy to appreciate, it's quite, quite pronounced, uh, hypodensities, stroke, <clears throat> ischemic stroke. This is another one, it's very subtle, and it's, it's not in the anterior circulation, it's not in the posterior circulation, it's, it's actually at the junction of anterior and posterior circulation. The arrows are pointing. And this is uh, what we call watershed territory infarcts. And usually we see them in patients who are hypotensive or for, a, for, a, for some length of time or patients who had like microemboli going up to the brain. So this is, a, this is a watershed territory infarct. But again, the main thing is it looks black. It looks blacker than the brain substance. It's hypodense. It's bad. It's ischemia. Um, sometimes a five, 
to 6% of patients who come in with acute focal neurological deficit actually have a subarachnoid hemorrhage. And you see, this is so subtle here. I don't know how many of you, can you all see this? The arrows pointing, yeah. You see this, this, this like tiny white lines in the very periphery of the brain? See these tiny white lines? This is blood. This is subarachnoid blood. You thrombolize this patient, you will kill this patient. This patient will be dead if you thrombolize him. So, so not always very, very obvious. Blood, intraparenchymal, yes, looks very obvious. But subarachnoid, very, very subtle. This is a very subtle subarachnoid hemorrhage. This is a much more kind of uh, obvious subarachnoid hemorrhage. You can see white in the, in the sulci. The space is filled. White, it's blood. This is what we are more familiar with. Uh, the, the classical subarachnoid hemorrhage appearance on the CT. This is basal cisterns, like the, 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 all the CSF spaces are filled. It's white. It's very generalized. This is blood. This is blood. This is ruptured aneurysm, most likely. And again, if you thrombolize this patient, you're going to kill this patient. This is white, again. But uh, it's kind of intraparenchymal, but it looks very well-defined very odd shaped. It's like very close to the cortex. If you see something like this, this is venous sinus thrombosis. And uh, it's very well defined. It's kind of venous kind of territory, very distal and uh, very well demarcated. You see some surrounding edema as well. So this is uh, another appearance of a, of a bleed, but bleed due to blockage of the veins in the brain. So the treatment is actually anticoagulation, which kind of it's kind of very odd. You, you think, well, there is blood in the brain, but you are anticoagulating? Yes, because the, the blood is due to obstruction of the vein. So that's why we have to anticoagulate. Not thrombolize, but anticoagulate. So what happens when patient presents with, um, with signs and symptoms suggestive of acute stroke? So in the, in, in the, <clears throat> I think the important thing to understand is that only half of patients that present have any infarct on the CT, so any obvious hypodensity. But that's a good thing, which means that the brain is intact, which means it's good, which means if there are no contraindications to thrombolysis, you can go ahead and thrombolyze. Okay? Because like I said, if you see a large hypodensity, it means that it's bad. It means that the damage has already occurred. So if you don't see anything obvious, no contraindications to thrombolysis, patient presents within four and a half hours, you can consider thrombolysis. And so, so those very early signs are, as we have seen, some loss of gray white matter, uh, loss of sylvian fissure, early hypodensity. And then as the time progresses, you see established infarct. And finally, the black hole. It's just like a black, big black area in the brain. And that's old, old stroke, established stroke. So suspected stroke, what to do? And this is a kind of very journal. You, this is for junior doctors, GPs, everybody. Uh, we have heard of fast face arm speech, time to call 999 or, or test all three. Uh, so uh, patient presents, patients have uh, weakness. So they can't speak, sudden onset of arm or leg weakness. Uh, somebody calls ambulance, they come to the hospital. And what paramedics do is they try and obviously rule out some stroke mimics. So they're suspecting a stroke, but they, they want to rule out stroke mimics as well. So there are some stroke mimics, such as hypoglycemia, sepsis, migraines, brain tumors. And I have to say, sometimes it's not very obvious uh, what exactly is going on. Sometimes we do thrombolize. I have thrombolized a stroke mimics. Uh, migraines, for example. So CT brain will be completely normal. And patients have weakness and acute and sudden onset. So not entirely clear always. So I think history is uh, very important in those patients. But so they come to the hospital and you have to get a CT brain as soon as possible because that's going to completely change, you know, the, how, you, how you manage the patient. Because if there is a bleed, it's a completely different pathway, completely different management. If it's a ischemic stroke, completely different management. So the first thing you have to do is take a quick history, rule out stroke mimics, get a blood sugar, check blood pressure, take quick history from relatives if patient can't talk and 
take a drug a good drug history if patients on warfarin and their inr is in therapeutic range uh, you can't thrombolyze if patients have taken dabigatran and apixaban in the last 6 hours 8 hours then you can't thrombolyze um, new tests are coming you can check factor this factor that but i think for all practical purposes not always available not always available out of hours uh, and in most hospitals even the mri scans are not available so that's why the management is entirely based on ct brain and really what you need is a ct brain to rule out bleed you don't want to confirm ischemic stroke see ct scan doesn't confirm ischemic stroke ischemic stroke is a clinical diagnosis ischemic stroke is a clinical diagnosis you don't do ct scan to confirm ischemic stroke because ct scan in 50% of patients is completely normal so why are you doing ct scan to rule out bleed okay very important to understand not to confirm ischemic stroke ischemic stroke can be ct can be completely normal in mri you may be able to see some changes uh, so ct brain you sorry, are going to, to stop you can you repeat that point again because the audio just went blank for a little while yeah so so ct scan you are doing in a hyper acute stroke in the assessment of patient who who's come in with a speech problem arm weakness leg weakness weakness you suspecting a stroke is to rule out bleed not to confirm a stroke ischemic because 50% of patients have completely normal brain scan when they present with ischemic stroke and the changes may take 4 to 6 hours so the ct brain you are doing to rule out bleed then the next thing you do is you assess suitability for thrombolysis and there is a scoring system called nihss national institute of health stroke score and it's 0 to 42 scoring system where 0 is completely normal 42 is the worst stroke and you have you consider thrombolysis if the score is between 4 to 24 but i think this is a arbitrary number you have to take many things into account uh if the score is more than 25 30 it means it's such a big stroke that you're probably not going to achieve much by thrombolysing that da damage has already been done and if it's a very very minor stroke um again those patients are very good prognosis they improve but having said that i have thrombolyzed someone with a score of 3 now if you look at the nihss severe dysphagia or almost complete aphasia gives you an nihss score of 3 but that patient was a singer his job his day job was a singer he used to sing you know he was a vocalist and and i saw him uh, in when i was on call about 3 4 years ago and i said to mr your stroke is very, very small and the family said you know this is what he does for living so it's very important that just as just as looking at just the score uh you have to look at the overall patient so i thrombolyzed him even though the score was only 3 and his speech got better and he was very grateful so you have to look at the overall patient okay this is what it looks like you can do it very quickly it just takes 5 minutes now what are we doing by thrombolyzing patients well really you want to save the penumbra and the penumbra is a surrounding area which is at risk so the center the brain arteries are end arteries and that's why the embolic strokes are very large so the af related strokes are very large and they have poor prognosis because the brain doesn't you know doesn't have time to develop collaterals uh, uh, ischemic strokes uh, due to large artery thrombosis uh, uh, sometimes they have a better prognosis than af related strokes because collaterals develop so in a stroke what saves you are collaterals very important to understand because the artery which is damaged is damaged is blocked you, uh, and the, the central part is damaged okay can't do anything about it so you are trying to save the surrounding area so to conclude why why stroke is urgent well time is brain and i am going to uh, ask uh, you guys uh, hang on every minute in which a large vessel ischemic stroke is untreated how many neurons die make a guess millions yeah absolutely so so 1.9 million neurons die every minute when stroke is untreated mm -hmm. and that's about 12 km of axons 12 km of axonal fibers every minute so 
Time is brain. Minutes matter. Thrombolysis windows four and a half hours currently in the UK. And uh, with new treatments coming in like to thrombectomy and so on, uh, uh, this, this window obviously can be extended up to six hours, eight hours, sometimes even 12 hours. Uh, but like I said, not all units have uh, those uh, facilities uh, available. So, <clears throat> so uh, get urgent CT, rule out bleed, admit stroke unit, and uh, speak to the expert. So suspecting a stroke, we've heard of this campaign. Uh, uh, I think it's very important to understand that uh, uh, time is the key. And if, when you are suffering a stroke, when you are, you are, you are impaired, you, you can't move, you can't speak, it's the bystanders, it's the other people. So very important that they understand you know, what's going on and, and they are aware. So we spend a lot of time you know, in raising uh, awareness uh, of a stroke. So face, arm, speech, time to, to, time to call 999 and test all three. And one last one I would like to, to make a comment on a posterior circulation strokes. So the NIHSS and all the studies, and all the trials, most of the trials, they are done on anterior circulation strokes, not on posterior circulation strokes. So if you have a large pontine stroke, you, you, you are completely, you are unconscious, you're comatose, okay? Um, but uh, you will be uh, uh, scoring low, you know, on the, on the NIHSS. So, um, so very important to understand that the scoring systems and everything is for anterior circulation strokes. Anterior circulation strokes are much more common, obviously, but the score, NIHS score itself is just a number. You have to take into account, uh, you know, everything and all the information completed. So I will stop here. <clears throat> if uh, anyone has any questions, I'm going to... Can we get... Yeah, I have a question for Vakas. Is he there? Vakas, can we get Vakas back, actually? Vakas, are you still there? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear yeah. Go on, Sameer. Yeah. Vakas, Salaam Alaikum. Salaam My question was, for example, a 40-year-old guy came and there were no medical problems. Okay, he went to the ER, he had a CT scan for a kidney stone, the ER thought, and then they found this 2-centimeter uh, mass, Hausfeld's unit of less than 10. Okay, it's very fat, rich mass. So then he comes to your clinic and he says, I don't have money, I have no insurance. So if I don't have any chemical testing, and he's absolutely fine. So mm -hmm. what are the chances I'm going to miss something? Uh, I think um, the issue with it is, like, uh, for example, I got quite many patients. We always, uh, like in the textbook, we read that a patient who got a few chromocytoma will present to you uh, sorry, you were talking about someone who got a less than 10. Yeah, less than 10. Pura less, less than, than 10. 10. Typical benign adenoma. CT scan was without contrast. Just to look at a kidney stone. Usko mein dard tha gaya. And everything is fine. But I just said that you have to go to a specialist. Ke paas, ya primary care. Ke paas, ke ji, usko biochemical workup. I said that I have blood pressure and diabetes and a family history. And my weight is bad. I have to exercise for 1 hours in the morning. I think it's, it's a bit unlikely that you are going to miss anything in that case. I will say that 90% of the time there should be no problem. But medical legally, it might be an issue. Um, because as a protocol you have to do. So I, I don't know about the US, how you deal with that sort of thing. For example, in UK, um, medical legally, you would be needing to do their hormone test. Um, I I think I'm not worried about the Cushing uh, for this patient. The only thing you would be main issue might be is the pheochromocytoma. Although majority of the pheochromocytoma, your Hounsfield is actually more than 10. 
but three, there might three. be some uh -huh. cases where it might be less than 10. So that will be the only thing which uh, I would be more worried about. Because even if he got a subclinical pushing, it's unlikely that in a completely normal patient, you are going to treat it anyway. So the only thing you might don't want to miss is the pheochromocytoma, which the chances are very low in someone who got a, a horns field of less than 10. Mm -hmm. But not, not zero. But the chances is not zero. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I have a couple of questions. I think Sadaf wanted to ask a question. Sadaf, go ahead. Naseem, this is a question for you. Um, you know, in vascular, when you thrombolyze someone or do an embolectomy, you always warn patients about reperfusion injury. Do you do the same for when you lyse patients with acute stroke? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. So, uh, uh, this is uh, for all stroke types. So, all stroke types. So, generally, rule of thumb, we advise patients that, look, one in five gets better and one in 20 bleed. And uh, those who bleed are not all intracranial because we are only worried about intracranial bleed. We're not worried about nose bleeds, etc. So, and out of those who bleed, um, only 5% are intracranial. So one in five get better, one in 20 bleed. And of those who bleed, 5% are intracranial. So yes, we do warn about reperfusion injuries and uh, it's essential. We can't go ahead. If patient can't talk, if they can't understand, if they're unconscious or whatever, then we have to take uh, you know, permission and, and take approval from family and, uh, and explain everything. Uh, and then we go ahead. Yes, exactly. So it is just that you warn them about the risk of bleeding secondary to lysis, but nothing more. Is that true? Because, yeah, that's uh, uh, because that's very different as compared to what we do for limbs because you want them about compartment syndrome, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, um, renal failure and, you know, all the systemic response, what you would have if you reperfuse someone. But yeah, that's more exactly. for sort of, you know, distal limbs and stuff. Is yeah. there anything specific you want them um, with regards to brain? No, nothing. We just want them that there is a risk, small risk of bleeding. And I obviously I'm guided by how big the stroke is because they get more benefit, but also they have high risk of bleeding as well. Um, mm -hmm. So I am kind of um, less optimistic if I, if I, if they present late, like towards mm -hmm. the four and a half hours, but towards like four hour, four hour, 15 minutes, kind of that towards that mm -hmm. range. And they have a, a large, you know, a hypodensity emerging on the CT. They have poor pre-morbid functional state. They are old. They have diabetes. They have risk factors. They are hypertensive. Sometimes I have to use Levitalol to bring the blood pressure down. If you are over uh, more than 180 millimeter of mercury systolic, you can't thrombolize. You have to bring it down. So if I know that I, I have used Levitalol and blood pressure is now sitting around 170, mm -hmm. higher end. So all these things I take into account and then tell, look, this is the risk and risk is slightly higher as compared to some other stroke patients. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the risk is precariously bleed and, uh, and we do, you know, discuss as much as we can, you know, with the, with the patients. Okay, thanks. Now, same a question for you, actually, a question and a comment as well. Uh, comment is, uh, obviously, I've seen over the last decade or so, there's been massive improvement in the way stroke services have actually been delivered uh, in the UK. And mainly by the presence of brain attack team, specialist stroke services, and also has bed. Uh, I just want to kind of actually ask you your take on that. And number two, um, there's a death of uh, a stroke specialists in the UK. And I know some, some centers of actually are asking um, acute physicians or radiologists to kind of do thrombolysis. What's your take on that? Well, yes. Uh, my take is yes, uh, yes and yes to both. Um, mm -hmm. The stroke unit, admission to stroke unit improves survival, improves outcomes. It's well known. Or is research done on that? And it's, it's a well-established fact. That's why we are doing this. This is evidence-based practice. Uh, compared to admission on a normal bed, on a normal ward, patients admitted to a stroke ward, they get their better outcomes, better functional outcomes, recovery, and so on. Because you have dedicated stroke nurses, uh, speech and language therapists, physiotherapists, occupational therapists, and so on. Um, and so, yes, better outcomes, absolutely. We need money. Uh, funding is an issue we were discussing earlier with, with Salman before we started the webinar. Funding is issue everywhere. I think uh, useful, you know, allocation of resources, um, very important. We spend a lot of time, you know, with policy makers, with governments, 
and with the with, with the management the the second question about shortage of stroke physicians oh yes oh yes D desperate 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 situation at the moment um um significant shortage of stroke physicians in the uk and i think generally everywhere in the world but in uk it's 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 very bad um it's very hard to find how to train recruit retain and um um yeah absolutely uh, and and i think we need uh, and the, yeah, so your point about acute physicians thrombolizing yes so there are different streams you can get into so acute physicians acute physician with a special interest in stroke neur neurologist with a special interest in stroke uh, interventional radiologist with a special interest in stroke and obviously geriatrician with a special interest in stroke so these are all the different streams you can get into you know um, your stroke uh, pathway um, but uh, yeah i mean and this is why because we we do not have uh, you know neurovascular physicians just doing stroke so that's why we need to pull you know specialists from other specialties and encourage them you know develop special interest so we are you know uh, well stocked I see. I see a lot of trend actually with the acute physician doing that. Thank you very much for the explanation. I just wanted you to share this uh, with the wider audience. Uh, just one actually comment for, um, in fact, a question for Vakas, if you're still there. Vakas, the question is, um, I'm, I'm not sure they've already covered that because because you know I was driving. I may have missed some of the presentation. And um, how often do you follow up the incident telomas actually? So do you have to follow them up by doing a yearly scan, or uh, what do you do? You just discharge them. Sorry if you've already answered the question. No, I think. Um the main stuff uh, here is actually previously we used to follow them. So previously we used to do the interval scans, etc. So now mm -hmm. what we normally do is we still follow them for some of them, but not all. So as I said in my presentation, we normally look at their horns field or their risk factors. So if there is someone who, whose horns field is less than 10, the lesion is homogeneous and the size is less than four centimeter, uh, so we normally discharge them if their hormone function is normal. So we normally don't follow them. However, those ones which are indeterminate, so those ones which doesn't fulfill these criteria, some of them we consider surgery, some of them we follow them. Uh, so that depends upon solely on the how the lesion is, how, your, how much suspicion of uh, malignancy you have in those uh, lesions. But those who are clear cut less than 10, size homogeneous and less than four centimeter, we discharge them. Previously, we used to follow them uh, and do an interval scan. Uh, but some, some of these patients where you, you do not have initial non-contrast CT, you, what my, you might do is if there is, if there is no feature to suggest malignancy clinically, you might do their scan in three to six month time, a non-contrast one, and that will serve both the purpose. Okay, thank you very much for that explanation. Thank you. <clears throat> Nassim, I have a question for you. Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay, so let's suppose if the patient come and uh, we diagnose with the, that patient with ischemic stroke and uh, on, 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 on EKG or tele-monitor, we find out patient definitely have a AFib. We have a documented AFib, okay? Yeah. So uh, then you have to anticoagulate, right? My question is, according to your experience or what you're, what you're thinking is when you are gonna start that person on fully anticoagulation, which can be warfarin or whatever, Eliquist or Zoralto or whatever yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so one in five patients who present with acute stroke uh, have mm -hmm. atrial fibrillation at the time of presentation. So 20% of patients have AF uh, when they first present, not previously diagnosed, diagnosed for the first time when they present with acute stroke. So when should you anticoagulate? So if patient is no previous, uh, diagnosis of AF just presenting for the first time. Um, you give antiplatelets for two weeks uh, and then you anticoagulate. Now, if the stroke is very, very small or if patient had a TIA, mm -hmm. then you can anticoagulate straight away. Uh, but you have, to, you have to do a CT scan uh, first to make sure you are not anticoagulating a bleed. Uh, so for TIAs, uh, if patient is an AF, they are a TIA, symptoms have completely resolved. Uh, they had a speech problem for five minutes. Now they're completely resolved, absolutely fine. No problems, no headaches, nothing. And they are in AF. So you, anti uh, you do a CT scan, rule out bleed, anticoagulate straight away. And the same for very, very small minor strokes. But any moderate to severe strokes, 
uh, you wait for two weeks because there is a risk of hemorrhagic transformation, you see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Brain is the only organ in the body that undergoes liquefactive necrosis. All okay. other organs undergo some, some form of fibrous, caseative type of necrosis. So when the cells die, so when the cells die in heart, the, it be they become stiff. They become fibrous, yeah? They become solid. They become hard. Brain is the only organ when the cells die, they become very, very soft and, 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 and weak. So there is a risk of hemorrhagic transformation. So you wait for two weeks and then you anticoagulate. You give antiplatelets, aspirin 300 milligram or clopidogrel 75, and then you anticoagulate. Got you. Thank you. Okay. Any more questions, guys? Yeah, just one question for Nassim. Yeah. Um, uh, what's the time for intra-arterial TPA? Do you guys do that there? Like time frame for that? Yeah, the, the time frame, uh, no, we don't do Is this. For, no, we don't do this in my hospital, but there are very few regional centers that do that. And uh, the, I think the key thing is that, first of all, you shouldn't delay the venous from intravenous TPA administration. Um, intra-arterial, uh, some studies showed six hours, eight hours, 12 but hours. The patient, the, yeah, the patient came in, it's already 4.5 hours. I'm out of that window and the patient has symptoms. So like I have a center one hour away and yeah. you know, patient says, you know, I'm a singer or what is what I do for a living and I have to really, medical legally, I'm stuck. So what do I do there? Should I just send them? It's already out of the window and... Yes, I think, I think if, if, the, if the regional center is just one hour away and they are just outside four and a half hours, yes, definitely, yes. Uh, if it's more than 12 hours, 14 hours, uh, probably damage has already occurred. But you see, sometimes you have to do, uh, you know, a better form of brain imaging because C, not just CT scan. So either you do CT perfusion or you do MRI, DWI. You need to look at, I mean, the same thing is for wake up strokes. If somebody went to bed, they were fine, now they woke up with weakness. When did they have the stroke? We don't know. So it's very, very difficult to say because now they've got up, they are weak. So did it happen just like two hours ago, four hours, six hours? We don't know. So we, we, if we want to do something, if we want to actively treat and do some intervention or thrombolize or something, we have to do a better form of imaging. So it has to be either a CT perfusion, MRI with diffusion weighted image, to look at what area is actually salvageable, what damage has already occurred, and is there some part of brain that we can actually save because otherwise there is no point. Sure. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Naseem. Thank you, uh, Vakas. Uh, excellent presentations by both of you. And thank you for stepping in, Naseem. Um, just kind of actually want to announce that the next presentation in October will be on the 6th of October. And happy for UK colleagues, uh, sorry, US colleagues, if you, will, if you guys are okay with this timing. Uh, we've got two excellent speakers. We've got Hastain Raza from Ireland, who's going to actually talk about um, orthopedic stuff, maybe joint infections. And then we've actually also got Sajid Mahmood from US. So please uh, do join us in um, on the 6th of October. Um, timing, if you guys are happy with this time, Mashoud and US colleagues, and we'll Good. stick with 5 p.m. UK time. Um, otherwise, we'll, we'll be doing 12 p.m. But uh, I, think, I think 5 p.m. seems okay for most of them. Is that right, Naseem? Yeah, I think we discussed them. 5 p.m. is okay. Most of them, except Australians. So True. we are okay. Yeah, okay. When, we, when we've got presenters from Australia, like Zafar, when he's presenting next year, we'll probably have to accommodate their requests then, okay? Yeah, we'll move it to midday then. Yeah. But thank you very much, Vakas and Naseem. Thank you both. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Vakas. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Thank you, guys. Thank you.